So my name is Bethany Patton. I am the Associate Director for the Sustainability Initiative here and an alum from the class of 2013 EMBA program. So this year, I'm the 2012 of the year. And I'm really excited to welcome my friend and classmate, Omar Mitchell, to be here today. Um, since, it, since I've had my job here, I've been watching Omar's career trajectory. And it's gotten to the point where I realize he's exactly what we hope every song experiences and goes through and achieves in our program. He had an internship that he turned into a job, in fact, was so good at that job that they created it for him. And then he went on and he hired interns, Sony interns, and is now the vice president of corporate social responsibility for NHL, where he's accomplished many things, including being covered in the Washington Post and <laughs> getting the league on to um, being the first league to actually really take this stuff seriously. Um, I have the pleasure of seeing him a couple times a year and seeing his work firsthand, and I'm really just happy to welcome you here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Bethany. Thank you, Office of External Relations. Thank you, Sloan Sustainability Initiative. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to present my work. Um, I have a very short amount of time to explain a lot of stuff to you. And I hope that it's engaging. I hope it's things that you will see is very cool. And, um, and more importantly, I want to hope, hopefully show to you that the work that we're doing here at the League in terms of sustainability is actually impacting the business of our sport. And that's the most important thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tee it up first with a video so you get the context and then we'll go from there. Athletics depend on a clean environment, clean air, clean water are all aspects that are important for the world and for sports, and particularly hockey. You know, people having outdoor ice to skate on in Canada is, is a huge part of my childhood and, 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 and what makes this game so great. Agility, adrenaline, and ice. Our game depends on them. Yet the ice our athletes grow up on is disappearing in our time. Our job, protect our sport. With 30 clubs across North America, and 750 players from more than 20 different countries, the NHL has become the world's premier ice hockey league. And with that growth has come a commitment to not only grow the sport, but to preserve our planet. To mitigate climate impacts, the NHL is dramatically reducing its waste and carbon footprint. Purchasing green products and renewable energy and also restoring our rivers. The NHL is, is taking the lead. They're not waiting for someone else to push them to do something. The partnership between the NHL and Constellation started during the 14-15 season, and you know it was very important for Constellation and for the NHL to make sure that every single game was sustainable. This is our earth, and we gotta take care of it, and we can't you know, let it slip for the next generation. We gotta take care of it now. We need to leave this world cleaner and, and better for the next generation to come so that they can enjoy the beautiful outdoors the way that we were able to enjoy. You know, our environment's everything. I think it's the number one priority for, uh, for all of us. Work with the environment is fundamentally good. It's good for the environment, it's good for the community, and it happens to be good business. But in all of the cases, I don't think that's the primary motivation. Learn more about our actions for the game and for our planet. Visit NHL.com slash green. Before I begin, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Omar Mitchell, class of 2012 MBA. Prior to, whoops, let me take this out. Okay, so for those who don't know me, I'm Omar Mitchell, MBA class of 2012. Prior to Sloan, I used to be an architect, practicing architect, 15 years in the profession. Uh, always wanted to be an architect. And after 2008 came, the market collapsed, um, real estate market collapsed, architecture and all professional services collapsed. And I was still young at the time, 
And so I thought, you know, let's see what else is out there. I had an interest in sustainability and sustainable business practices. And I thought that an MBA would be a great um, opportunity to transition into the next part of my career, not knowing where I would go um, when I got my MBA. And uh, long story short, MIT and the NHL had this unique partnership that Bethany talked about. And I was the second intern to do that uh, fellowship. It was a Sloan Sustainability Fellowship. And that's how I literally created my job. And so uh, I think that's important to know because the way that I set up this conversation, this talk, I want it to be like a TED Talk. And there are certain principles for a TED Talk that um, you, know, you can research and you can find it. One of them is that the, the speakers usually have some story that says that they are you know, deeply committed to this cause. And so I, I wanted to show that the first thing is that I grew up in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago, which for those who don't know, is right there, 11 degrees north of the equator. And it has a lot of this, beaches. So I don't know how to ice skate, and I do not know how to play hockey, which is perfectly fine. The second thing that I want you to know is that I do not consider myself an environmental activist, although that's all well and good. And you will not see me on these types of vessels, nor will you see me on top there, B, and will you see on any of these types of scaling buildings. That being said, though, as you saw in the video, this is the roots of our sport. And this is why we take this seriously. And we can tell that narrative very, very succinctly because of this. Our sport is directly impacted by climate change and freshwater scarcity. Regardless of what your politics are, 15 of the last 16 years have been the hottest on record. 2016 had the hottest year on record. In addition, we are some, in some markets, there are droughts. And we expect a third of our clubs to be in those markets. In addition, if you think about it, we play in a giant refrigerator, right? So we are one of the most energy intensive sports out there. So it's important for us to understand the roots of our game of where people play outside as well as inside if we want to preserve this for the future generations. And the reason why that's important is because this year we celebrated our 100th anniversary. So if we want hockey for another 100 years, we need to take this into account. So I want to set it up by saying this. Pro sports has influence. There are over 170 million US adults that follow professional sports. And if you think about it, 71% of, well, this is a known stat, 71% of US adults follow sports, while only 16% follow science. So if you think about a way of engaging folks on science, this is one way. And the reason why I say that is because sports has always been a catalyst for talking about social issues. The color barrier, the gender barrier, even social issues like HIV. So if we have the ability to use sports in a unique way to tell this story, we should. In addition, from our friends at PwC, this is big business. $75 billion business expected in 2020. And on top of that, you will see that professional sports leagues with the, um, the NFL being a $13 billion, uh, $13 billion a year business. I know, by the way, Commissioner Goodell made an announcement that he wants to make their league $25 billion by 2025. This is big, big business. We are only the fourth largest sports league in, in, uh, in the US, the fifth if you count the league in Mexico, the, the soccer league in Mexico. We're at $4 billion right now. This, has, this is big business. And when you talk about big business for the NHL, we have 76 million fans that watch our game. We have 14 million followers on social media 
22 million fans that go through our turnstiles every single year. So we have the, the ability to impact many, many, many subsets of people in our fans. And we can use that to tell this story. What is the story? NHL Green was started in 2010 as a mandate by our commissioner to promote sustainable business practices. And we have all kinds of goals such as reducing our impacts, measuring that impact, offsetting wherever we can re offset, um, and inspiring this type of environmental message and environmental story. I'm going to run down a whole list of cool things that we've done since we started in 2010. The most important was that we were the first league to put out a sustainability report in North America. And why was that important? We got, we uh, calculated our carbon footprint. 550,000 metric tons of carbon are emitted each year by our sport. In contrast, a coal-fired plant in New York State emits about 23 million tons of carbon emissions. So if you think about it, it's not that much, but it is still significant. In addition, because of unique partnerships, which I'm going to get to, and the video is off by a little bit, we are now ranked the 23rd largest green power user in the US by the EPA. We are in the ranks of companies that you guys probably work at, Amazon, Apple, Google. We are the number one sports and entertainment property to have that ranking. And we do, the, do so by the purchase of renewable energy certificates and carbon offsets, which are just like fungible commodities that are traded um, for doing things like building solar panels or carbon mitigation offsets. We can talk about that offline. In addition, one of the things that makes our league unique is that we get all of our clubs to take the prepared but unused food and donate it to local food banks. A hundred tons of food are diverted from landfill. That's equivalent to 120,000 meals. And that is significant because that's talking about getting back into the local community. In addition, water is in our DNA. So we want to make sure that we are restoring waterways wherever possible and making sure that we're addressing fresh water concerns. 70 million gallons of water have been restored to date. We plant trees. I'm not a big fan of planting trees, but we plant trees because it's important for reforestation efforts in our local markets. We do legacy projects, which is enhancing the, the rinks in which we play by putting LED lights and putting recycle bins so that kids know proper recycling habits, these types of things. We even do things like gear donation drives, um, where we ask fans to bring their, their used gear, typically kids' items, that, uh, the gear that they, they um, outgrow very fast, and ask them to donate. And so we did a very cool thing where we put a plexiglass sheet in front of the goal of a net, um, the net, and it was used as a drop box. And that way, we get fans to, uh, to start to donate. And the reason why this is important is because there are two major barriers to entry for our sport, equipment and ice time. And as you see, as I go through this presentation, you're going to hear over and over again why and how we've been addressing these concerns so that we can ensure that we're going to grow our game. So that's all the good stuff that we've been doing. When we show and measure all of the different stakeholders in our sport, as an example, our fans, we see that our fans measure uh, definitely are more prone to doing environmental product, uh, buying environmental products or services, or doing eco-friendly activities. So our fans are interested in it. Our clubs are involved in it. We've got clubs that have, uh, that have achieved LEED certification. We have clubs that are putting in the latest innovations in their buildings to reduce energy costs. We have clubs that are participating and engaged in this dialogue. Our corporate partners. All we, when you look through the list of all of our corporate partners, when we did an analysis, and you'll see bears, you'll see cars, you'll see tires, all the usual suspects. When we did an analysis of those partners, 
almost 80% of our partners have some public facing commitment to environmental sustainability. So if our corporate partners are interested in it, and our fans are interested in it, and our clubs and our team presidents are interested in it, why should we be telling the story more? We have a unique platform to tell that out there. And of course, the players. The players are the ones that can tell the most authentic story out there. When Andrew Ferentz, you saw him talk about playing outdoors and the thrill of skating on, on frozen ponds, you can't get any more authentic than that. And when sports talks about social issues in an authentic way, that's where you're going to get the most amount of buy-in. So I want to stress on this particular slide because this was a slide that I think got me the job at the NHL. They asked me, what is the business case for doing sustainability in sports? And those three buckets were the most important. Green facility and arena operations, implementing all of the energy efficiency products and services, equates to underlying cost savings. Corporate partnerships, second revenue stream, major revenue stream for, for sports properties. You can sell or get sponsors to get onto, your, uh, plat onto a sustainability platform and give you money because they want to uh, partner with sports properties or brands that have shared values. That's revenue generation right there. Telling the story in communications and PR messaging, that tells a story and reinforces why the brand is, is taking the steps that it's doing. And all of those three points yield underlying value creation. And so I'm going to dig deep and dive into each one of these buckets so that I can show you exactly how we're doing it. So with the green venue operations, you will see that when we did an analysis of our carbon footprint, a lot of people think, well, I'll, I'll ask the question, where do you think our biggest impact is in, uh, in our carbon emissions? Anybody? Yes. Exactly. Everybody thinks that travel is one of the biggest emitters of carbon footprint of our carbon footprint. It's not. And perhaps we'll talk about it in the questions and answers. It's actually energy consumption in our buildings. 75% of our carbon uh, footprint comes from energy consumption. Now, we can talk about the scope of carbon emissions and scope three emissions, which is, uh, we'll talk about that um, in the questions and answers. But that's, if 75% of our carbon footprint is energy consumption, so that's exactly where we should be targeting our efforts, right? Remember, we play in a giant refrigerator. We use 321 million gallons of water every single year. It's a hell of a lot of water, right? So what are we doing? We have arenas that are taking on the latest technologies, products, and services out there. The newest team in our league, which is starting at the, in September, is going to be Las Vegas at T-Mobile Arena. We're going to be playing hockey in the desert. And so how do we accommodate that? T-Mobile Arena is one of the most advanced multi-use sporting facilities in the world. They have achieved a LEED goal certification, leadership in energy and environmental design, right? And we're seeing that all of these arenas, like Rogers Place in Edmonton, LEED Silver certification, and even the new Detroit Arena, they're going to get a LEED certification as well. If you do an analysis of all of the new sporting facilities that are being built, nine out of the last 10 have achieved LEED certification. This is a trend that's happening. And it's a trend whether it's because it's being used by tax dollars, whether it's because if you're building a multi-use facility, there's a need to want to show that there is environmental stewardship. These are all factors that, that factor into why these buildings are being built to environmental specification. And this is also a telling slide. When you look at an analysis of all of the buildings in our league, you will see that the majority of them were built 20 years ago. 
So they're reaching, their pro equipment and products and services are reaching end of life in those buildings. And communities now are keeping those buildings for longer, right? You see some of those old buildings and they'll put more uh, renovations into them. They'll, they'll put those massive scoreboards that look like school buses to get people to come into their arena. But they're keeping, they're being used longer. And so there's an ability to, to get more of these energy efficient and new innovations into these facilities. And those new innovations are taking the form of things like LED game lights. The lights that are used to illuminate the ring surface. 30 to 40% energy uh, efficiency over regular metal halides. They are significantly more um, efficient and, and they don't even produce as much heat and therefore you don't have to use as much air conditioning in the building to keep the ice cold. One other quick note, um, you remember that there was a, um, a super event that happened a couple years ago where uh, the lights went off for a little bit of time, there was a little bit of a power outage, and it took 19 minutes for those lights to come back on. I won't tell you what, what uh, event that was, but these lights are instant on off. This is the type of innovation that's happening. We are seeing multi-use facilities putting in new innovations like bloom fuel cell servers. This creates energy on site using albeit natural gas, so it's not a completely renewable source, but what it does is that it creates the energy on site, therefore making it highly efficient. 99.9% .9 efficient, as a matter of fact. So I would argue that uh, keep a look out at Bloom Energy because this technology is being used in data centers, it's being used by the tech industry to ensure resilience in their products, in their um, data centers and warehouses and whatnot. We're seeing things like innovative ice plants being developed. And one of the things in particular that's going to be coming up is in 2020, we're gonna have something called a refrigerant phase out of a particular refrigerant that's used across the board, R22. This is going to be a seismic event in our industry because majority of community rinks and NHL arenas use R22 refrigerant. And so we wanna make sure that we're on top of and making sure that we know what alternatives are out there for that type of refrigerant phase out. There are things like anaerobic digesters that take the food that's used in the arenas and creates water out of them. Uh, those are types of innovations that are happening. Even car charging stations, right? Um, and getting the fans engaged to tell that story. Community gardens that are planting produce in stadiums that are being used in concessions. I want to just pause there for a second to emphasize this point. When we talk about sustainability now, we're not talking about sustainability just for energy efficiency's sake. The narrative is now innovation. What we're doing here is innovative. All those technologies, products, and services are innovation. Our new administration has an office of innovation, right? So the narrative that we go out to the marketplace whenever I go to any of our NHL clubs and arenas is to talk about, it's not just about saving the planet and energy efficiency. This is about innovation and putting in the latest technologies, products, and services to get an, an ROI, a significant ROI on those investments. Corporate partnerships. What we're seeing is all of those different categories are monetizable and people want to work with us on it. And one example of that was Constellation, our vertically integrated energy services provider. No other, this was, we had, this was the first time that a league had signed on to an energy services provider. And for the past three seasons, in partnership with Constellation, we have counterbalanced our carbon footprint which allowed us to be the 23rd largest green power user in the US. And the good thing about Constellation is, is that they are like our official energy consultants. So when I go to the arenas and make all my arena visits, I've got energy experts behind me that, tell, that can tell the facility operators, here's how you can be more energy efficient. They're the experts, I just work at the NHL, all right? And Constellation can tell that story using infographics, 
using our platforms so they get shared value in telling their story as well. Because insofar as they want to educate fans about how they're going green as a company, Constellation sees this as a B2B opportunity. They want to be able to go into buildings and sell more commodity, green power hopefully, and more energy efficiency technologies, products, and services. And we have PSAs that we do with them and whatnot. I'll give you another example of this. Brands that have shared values with us, Miller Coors, Coors Light. Coors Light just launched this new campaign, Everyone Can Recycle, which is about recycling of their aluminum cans. And so what we did to activate with them, we had an outdoor game where we play hockey in a baseball or football stadium. This one was in Pittsburgh. And at a beer garden that they had, they did an activation where you get the fans to crush their cans, crush, and they create pucks, and then they can go and do skills competitions. That's the type of experial, experiential activation that gets fans at least more um, educated about recycling habits, right? Other than put the plastic in the recycle bin, right? And I want to stress this point. We can only do so much at the NHL. But if we can influence our 76 million fans to do things, that's where we're going to have the most amount of impact. So that's why this is important, right? And if we could just get one fan to do one thing in their local community, that's, that's, the, benefit, that's the value add. Communications, PR, and, and messaging. We have things like our NHL Green Week, where we tell the story of what our clubs are doing. Our clubs are doing Go Green Nights, where they get fans involved and they tell their story um, in, local, uh, in their local times, in, in events, and in games. We have clubs that are telling their story and putting out reports or telling how they're doing all of their stuff and energy in their arenas and telling that story as a narrative to fans to get them engaged. And we even have the athlete engagement. And I can't stress this enough that we can only do so much at the league level, but if the athletes talk about it, that's where the authentic messaging will happen. The athletes are the ones that are going to be able to tell the story. And a clear example of that was this that happened five days ago. After um, the administration made an announcement about the Paris Accords, one of our captains for the Blackhawks, Jonathan T Taves, he put something on Instagram that said, regardless of what your politics are, we should be doing more for our planet. And it's things like this that get 32,000 likes, <laughs> whereas when we message Green Week, we only get you know, X number of likes. But that's the type of power that the athletes have in telling this narrative. And we need to be able to leverage that more. I know that he's not an athlete in our league, but if you look at LeBron James, he has 80 million followers on Instagram and Facebook. When you look at Ronaldo, when you look at any of these big athletes, they have massive social media following. We need to get them more engaged, and we need to get them more engaged in a way that's accessible for them to tell an authentic story, rather than feeling apprehensive of telling the story and then going to their SUVs and their 25,000 square foot homes. This is the biggest, uh, this is one of the biggest initiatives and the final thing I'm gonna talk about which is our Greener Rinks campaign. Remember I told you two barriers to entry, equipment and ice time. What we'd like to do is take all of the key learnings from the NHL arenas, all those technologies, products, services, all those innovations, and bring it down to the community rink level. There are 4,500 community rinks across North America. On average, 80% of them are 20 plus years old. If you've ever played hockey in one of these arenas, sometimes you'll see that they are very old. And therefore, they're very energy efficient, inefficient. And it's a big problem for us because as energy costs rise, ice time costs rise, which means less people play our sport. 
and therefore it's a, bar a major barrier to entry. Compiled or uh, coupled with the R22 refrigerant phase out, many of these rings potentially could be uh, gone. And if we don't have rinks, we're not gonna have ice hockey players, kids that are gonna grow into fans, that's gonna grow our business. For every youth that plays our sport, it's equivalent to 3.1 fans. So it's in our vested interest to make sure that these rinks are operating as efficient as possible. And so what we want to do is be the clearinghouse for that information. Those best practices are found on our website that show you all of the different things that I mentioned, lighting, uh, efficient ice plants, all of that stuff. We hope to take those best practices and share them to the community rinks, which will hopefully lower operating costs and therefore hopefully lower ice time costs, which grows the sport. That's the most important thing. And what's significant about that is that it covers the most important part of what we consider sustainability. Environmental sustainability, financial sustainability, showing the financial business model for doing this work, and thereby showing social sustainability. Social sustainability is the ability to get um, folks that perhaps are underprivileged or economically disadvantaged to get them to be involved in more community things like our sport. And those, that trifecta makes our sport and our business grow for the triple bottom line effect. So with that, at 2.33, I'm gonna end there. And um, I know I ran through this pretty fast, but I wanted you to have a perspective of how we're doing this and how this type of work is so influential to the growth of our business. And so with that, thank you.